Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This is God's word. Paul tells Timothy here to charge them before God. Who is Timothy supposed to charge? Well, if you look back in your Bible, you can find the answer in chapter 2, verse 2. He says, faithful men who will be able to teach. He's talking to teachers. Timothy, I need you not to be timid any longer, but I need you to boldly charge these men who want to teach, who are aspiring to teach in the church, who are being equipped to teach in the church, they know that they're entering into God's courtroom and they will be held accountable to God for the things that they say because words really do matter. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3.23 that we are to work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Paul is telling Timothy, those men who would like to preach and teach in the church, that they need to be bold to preach the truth, to not back down, to not waver with the culture, whether that's the pervading culture outside the walls of the church or the culture inside the church, because there can be a culture in both areas, people applying pressure to the preacher. Timothy felt this same pressure. He was in Ephesus where Paul had started that church and the whole city was a pagan city devoted to the worship of Artemis. And in that city, Timothy ends his life by stepping in front of a Mardi Gras parade with beads and every other thing of debauchery and he calls them out on their sin. Do you think that was well received? Is it well received in our day when we call sin, sin, whether it's our sin or the sin of other people? Of course not. No one likes to be exposed for their sin. Timothy, however, preached the gospel, exposed them of their sin, and they stoned him to death. That's what we find in the writings of antiquity. And Paul says here to Timothy, avoid irreverent babble. If you have your Bibles open, maybe on the left of this page, you'll see 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, you'll find in verse 20, he concludes that first letter saying almost the same thing. He says, O Timothy, guard the, the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Or by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. What is he saying? He's obviously concluding a letter on a high note, an emphasis. And now again, he restates the same thing in his second letter to Timothy. What is he trying to do? Well, he's making a point that when you speak, make sure you're speaking the truth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. But if you'll notice in 1 Timothy, he talks about a knowledge. Be very apprehensive, or as Presbyterians like to say, be very careful. It's their favorite word. Careful when there is a teacher who comes in the church and he says, I have a secret knowledge. I have a chart I would like to show you. This will happen on certain, certain date, and this is going to happen on this date. Because it happened in the early church, this is called Gnosticism, where they had a secret 
knowledge. And there are plenty of ministers, I use that word lightly, who think they have a secret knowledge. Oh, you poor pitiful people, you just don't know what I know. You should listen to what I have to say. It's not what Paul tells Timothy from the pages of Scripture ordained and written by the Holy Spirit through Paul. He says, no, 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 avoid irreverent babble. Be on high alert. Anytime you're listening to a minister speak, when you're listening to someone who's teaching, well, teaching hopefully the pages of Scripture, but many times there are those people who like to go off into babble. Babble. You remember the Tower of Babel? God scattered these people. And we have false prophets all over the place. False prophets who say, I know something you don't know. Like little children. Stay far away from those people. If you can't cross-reference it in the Bible, you can't see it where God has clearly written it for us because it is written. If there's someone who says, I've got a secret word from God, stay far far away from those people. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Stick with the truth. What do you know to be the truth? The pages of Scripture. What's in the Scripture? The Spirit of Truth wrote the Scripture. Stay with Him. You don't have to get off into myths and genealogies and all kinds of charts and speculation. Why don't we just stay with the sovereign Scripture? And these people who engage in Babel well, they are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. That's the way Paul puts it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. They really don't speak the truth. They'd like to lead you off and down, well, as my grandmother used to say, rabbit trails. If you have someone who's trying to teach you something new from the Bible and you can't see it from the pages of Scripture, oh, it's hidden in the Aramaic. You can't really see it there. All right, there's just a little bit of Aramaic in the Bible, number one. Number two, if they really are a teacher, a teacher should have a heart of a teacher, which means they should be able to simplify and explain instead of making it more complex. Let's look at this passage, and I want you to see how Paul tells Timothy that we have to rightly handle the word of truth, stick with the word of truth, not your word of truth, but the Lord's word of truth, and there are some of those that have swerved from the truth. So let's hop back into the text. Take a look at verses 14 and 15, and we'll see the word of truth. He says, remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Remind them of what? You see what he says there? He says, remind them of these things. Remind them of what things? What are you talking about? Well, if you start in chapter 1, verse 1, and you work your way all the way down to the verses that we're looking at today, you would see that over 10 times, Paul says, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. He doesn't get very far away from Christ Jesus. He's always lifting up Christ. He's always exalting Christ. He wants you to know who the Logos is, the truth, the word of truth. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth can be found in a person, and Jesus says, I am the truth. Now, we have a lot of people in our day who want to tell you their truth, but many are false prophets. Among us in the church, outside the church, and those inside the church, many of them are people who like to pick theological parasites off the back of gnats. If you noticed from Paul's writings, he loves Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, sure, he's a towering intellect, but he never gets far away from Christ. Because he knows if he gets away from the Lord Jesus Christ, he's lost the truth. And he's pushing the same thing here on Timothy. Timothy, remind them of these things. Remind them of Christ. In chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality. Christ, he is our Savior. Solomon said in Proverbs 17, 28, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. 
when he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. Hmm. If we're not lifting up the Lord Jesus, then maybe we should remain silent. Or maybe other Christians should de-platform other people. How do you do that? Don't listen. Don't engage. Here he says, charge them. Charge them before God, Timothy. Those who are going to be teachers and preachers in the church, charge them before God. Bring them before the Almighty God. Let them know that they're going to be held accountable for every countless or maybe even every word that they say, whether in front of people or in private. That's a scary word, especially for teachers and preachers, people who love to run their mouths. Paul's telling Timothy, be bold. Be bold to these men. Don't back down from these men. He's telling them, remember, we could get into all kinds of conversations about the minutia. We could get into the fine details. And we should know the fine details of the pages of Scripture as ministers of the gospel. And that's why I'm in favor for ministers to go to seminary. I know, some people call it cemetery. But you need to be trained. You know how many guys that started seminary with me and now they dropped out of the first semester or within a year or two? This is just too hard. This is too time consuming. You need men who have been tested so that they can, as Paul will say in a minute, rightly handle the word of truth. And we don't have to get far away from the word of God to explain the word of God because the word of God always explains itself. And here, Paul tells Timothy, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. You see that word ruin there? It's literally the Greek word katastrophe. What does that sound like? Catastrophe. It's a catastrophe. How many of you lived through the 1980s and you see all the TV evangelists? You saw all the preaching. And it was, hey, if you give your money right now, we'll bless you. The Lord will give you a whole bunch more in return. How many of you saw the prosperity gospel that was exported from here over to Africa, which is still alive and well on that continent? It's an awful, awful thing when men want to preach the gospel for a selfish gain. How many have you known in your own lifetime who've been preaching the word, so to speak, for their own selfish gain? Paul says here, no. No, when we preach, we are to help others grow up into Christ into every way. Now, as we look at this text this morning, Paul says in verse 15, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. You see how he says, present yourselves? Present yourselves. Present yourselves every morning as a living sacrifice. Present yourselves as you go before the people to preach. Pray and pray and pray that you, Holy Spirit, might use the word to actually edify the people, to evangelize that the people that do not know you. And here Paul is saying to him, make sure that you equip the preachers, that you charge the preachers, that you, you multiply the preachers. We do not need more politicians. How many of you would agree? We need more preachers who would preach the word of God. Because the only thing that will transform the lives of people is it's not more laws. Laws do no good. Because find people, people find loopholes in the laws. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart and the mind, it changes a person from the inside out. Here's what we like to do. Change them from the outside in. That doesn't work. It never works. That's why you read the Old Testament and you see legalism. I'm going to clean myself. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be just. And in the whole time, you need to repent of your religiosity. Paul, oh, he says, you need to present yourself. God, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I leading these people? Am I loving these people? Am I feeding the flock? Or are they starving to death? Is there a famine in the land, a famine in the church? We should never be skinny on Scripture because God says his word will not return void. You know, this is what Paul did. Paul preached the word. He went before people everywhere preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he presented himself to God saying, hey, look at what I'm doing. I'm preaching, I'm preaching the word. I'm preaching Christ and the resurrection. Paul is a great example for us of a man who didn't care what other people thought. That's so hard to do, isn't it? Because we care so much about what everybody else thinks. We're so wrapped up in it. I mean, this is why social media is such a big deal. Because it gives a pipeline for narcissism. It breeds it. Paul says this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10, 18. He says, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. It's not about me commending myself. It's not about you commending me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ approving me and commending me in accord with his scripture. Is this sound doctrine? Does this come from the word which is the truth? And what will happen if you present yourself as one approved? Well, I'll go back to the text. He says, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Timothy, you don't have to be ashamed. You can be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Committing your work to the Lord. Lord, help me. I need help as I charge these men. He finishes and says, by rightly handling the word of truth. Rightly handling the word of truth. We're going to see it here in a second, but some people love to twist the truth, half-truths. And their father is Satan because he is the father of lies. He takes half-truths, he takes truths, and he subtly twists them, and he has his own agenda. And that's what we've seen throughout church history. Men who would love to twist what God's word actually says to fit their agenda, to fit their own plan. Rightly handling the word of truth. You know, this kind of has echoes back into the Old Testament. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, it says, Every word of God proves true. That's wonderful, isn't it? Every word of God proves true. Not man, not a collection of men, actually. But every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. We should not be like the people at the Tower of Babel, but we should be like the people at Pentecost. What do the people do at the day of Pentecost? They spoke Holy Spirit saturated words. How do we know that? Well, we usually like to get off into the ditch and talk about speaking in tongues and those kinds of things when we talk about Pentecost. But all we need to go is go back to the text. If we actually read our Bible, we can find the answer. If you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 11, it says the people were hearing them in their own tongues, the mighty works of God. What were they doing? They're preaching the gospel. They're talking about the greatness of God. They weren't focused on tongues or any other things. They were focused on God. God alone, about what he had done in Jesus Christ. That's rightly handling the word of truth. Paul, again, telling Timothy, don't be ashamed. 
Do not be timid. Stand boldly. Charge these men because if you charge them, if, they're, if you're, they see you bold, they can move out and go be bold as well as they preach the good news. Yes, they move, may lose life and limb. But the Lord will redeem the work. I have to tell you, there are many times that I have preached, I have taught, I have spoken in schools, I've shared the good news. And sometimes you think, wow, is this falling on deaf ears? Is anyone really listening? Is there anyone really coming to faith? And every single time, God's word proves true. Because there are those who either come to faith at that exact time or sometime down the road. I've had people call years later and say, hey, you said this 10 years ago. And it changed. What did I say? And they'll quote some scripture. I really want you to be encouraged today that when you share the good news of Jesus Christ and you use his word, it will not return void. Be bold. We have a whole new dynamic here in the United States today. We have very polarized society. And many times we like to default to, I want to walk in grace and humility, and I don't want to say anything that might be controversial, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, in doing so, many times we're actually hurting them eternally for not speaking the truth to them. Yes, the truth hurts, but the truth is what heals. The truth is what brings people to faith in Christ. Paul tells Timothy, rightly handle that word. Make sure they're rightly handling that word. I have to tell you, I'm praying that the Lord would send even more to this congregation not to stay. See, that's what you're expecting to hear, right? I want, I want there to be a huge crowd, and I want people to stay. No, actually, I don't. I want a whole big crowd of people to come so we can send people out to plant more churches in West Cobb. Now, that's really weird, isn't it? Because most churches want to protect their kingdoms. Oh, this is my little kingdom. This is my little curb. This is my little road. And when a church does that over long periods of time, it dies because it focuses on their navel. Oh, they're big, they're old, they got a giant bank account. They're reaching no one in their own backyard. That's why I deputize every one of you every single week to go out and to share the good news right where you live, work and play. Don't be ashamed to share the good news. Oh, sure, we need to form some things that send some people to certain places and do things, but you are the place that it starts with. You have to go share this good news. You have to look for every opportunity. You have to be bold in your faith. And I'd like to charge you in the presence of God today that if you're a Christian here, you have a personal responsibility because you have the most powerful thing on the face of the earth, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are responsible for sharing the good news. Don't think we're going to form a committee and send somebody out to do evangelism. Evangelism starts with you. You remember what Jesus said? Disciples are like, hey, when are we going to form a committee? And when are we going to deputize a couple of people to go out and do some evangelism? Because, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to do that. We'll give some money. We'll, we'll pray for you. You heard that one, haven't you? Hey, we'll pray for you when you go out. That's, that's what the disciples were thinking. Did you look at what Jesus said to the disciples? He says, no, you. You will be my witnesses. You, you, you. You have this power today. The power of the living God, the Holy Spirit in you to be able to share the good news. Oh, but I'm retired. Doesn't get you off the hook, sorry. You can't retire from the gospel. Oh, well, you know, I'm middle life. I'm really busy. I'm trying to raise kids. Doesn't get you off the hook. You have even more opportunities to share the good news with people. We do need more Christians sharing the good news, especially in a day where it is upside down. Nonetheless, if you rightly handle the word of truth, what does it do? We'll go back to the text. Take a look at verses 16 through 18. He says, but avoid irreverent babble, or it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. 
and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. What's Paul's major statement here? There are some who have swerved from the truth. You have to use the truth so that you can expose those who have swerved from the truth. Don't you love how Paul straight up names people? I want more pastors to do this. Just start naming people who have swerved from the truth. Here he says, there are some that have swerved from the truth and they're leading people to more and more ungodliness ungodly in the church how many of you ever heard of Benny Hinn it's shameful how many of you ever heard of Anley Stanley shameful men who are making their own ways of doing exegetical sermons. Eh, I can interpret whatever I would like to interpret from this passage. No, God has a hermeneutical principle. It's called the pages of scripture. They interpret the other pages. And when we move away from the early church and we move away from the creeds and the confessions, which were set out by godly people, well, we move into more and more ungodliness and it will spread like gangrene. Ew. That's disgusting, isn't it? I mean, medically speaking, gangrene is a localized death and decomposition of body tissue resulting from either obstruction of circulation or bacterial infection. You seen this happen in the church? An infection? A cut off of circulation? A division in the church? Someone who said, I'm preaching the truth, just follow me. I have a secret knowledge, you poor pitiful people. You're just children. You don't need to know anything. Just listen to what I have to say and follow me. Men who cause gangrene, and what do you do with gangrene? All you can do is amputate. See, unfortunately, we live in the United States of America, and there's really no standards for ministers anymore. Not according to the government law, right? I mean... Any one of you could go onto the internet after we leave service, or you could do it right now if you want to during the middle of the service, and you could pay $35 and you can be ordained by the Word of Life Ministries. 35 bucks. It's a pretty good gig, isn't it? And then you too can get a housing allowance, can get a tax break. There's no standards, but there should be standards should have standards according, number one, to the pages of scripture. Number two, there should be some kind of creeds. There should be some kind of confession that you actually adhere to. And here he says they've swerved from the truth. They've got gangrene. And oh yeah, by the way, their names are Hymenaeus and Philetus. <laughs> 2,000 years later, their names are still in here. That's funny, all right? I just want you to know, Paul wasn't scared to call people out. Oh, but you can't do that. You've got to be nice. You've got to be a Christian. Boy, if I started calling people out, we'd be here all afternoon. And I'm just talking about here in West Cobb. It's pathetic. Paul actually called Hymenaeus out in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. He says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul did a little excommunicado. Those are out of the church. And here he says it's Hymenaeus and Philetus. This Hymenaeus guy, golly, he just can't stop, can he? I mean, he bounces from one church to another church. You know, you know he, he doesn't like you, so he bounces you from the session. And he gets another session in place, so he can do what he wants to. And look, it's... Hymenaeus, he's skidded and he's deviated and he's telling them that the resurrection has already happened. And he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. This is a spiritual resurrection, guys. The Greek 
philosophy had crept into the church a long time ago. It's still in the church today. And Greek philosophy said, the body, it's really, really bad. The body does awful things. But if the spirit, if we can get the spirit out of the body, that's the good part. The spiritual is always the good part. Well, according to the pages of scripture and according to what Jesus did when he was resurrected, he had a true body. See, the great, grand, glorious exaltation of God is that when we die, it's not over. Yes, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. However, there will be a day when the trumpet will sound. Anybody play trumpets in here? Because I like trumpets. We could use some trumpet players. The trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise. You will not live for eternity in a disembodied life force like Avatar or paganism or pantheism. You will have a true body, the most true body you've ever had, because we live in fallen, sinful bodies. Now, but there will be a day when we will have a true, resurrected, glorified body where we will sit and we will feast sumptuously with the Lord at his table, which we're about to go to in just a minute, which is just a foretaste of what is to come. Paul calls them out. And he says, Hymenaeus and Philetus, they love the twisted truth. And if you thought Paul was just being cantankerous and it's just Paul, you know, Paul's just that kind of guy who calls people out. Well, how many of you remember the lover boy, John? You know, the one Jesus loved. Well, he actually calls somebody out. If you actually go to 3 John chapter 1, verse 19, he calls out a false prophet in the church. He says, I've written some thing to the church, but Diotrephes likes to put himself first. He does not acknowledge our authority. <laughs> John calls a guy out too by name and it's here 2,000 years later I think it's pretty good biblical grounds and warrant for us to call people out when they deviate when they swerve from the truth now I know some of you are thinking please stop don't don't say any more names up there and let's just be nice and kind isn't that a fruit of the spirit yes it's also through the spirit to be loving and to be loving is to speak the truth speak the truth in love well john paul all of them had to fight against false teachers false prophets who had come into the church and paul says they are upsetting the faith of some some not all Remember, there's always a remnant who will be bold for the gospel of Jesus Christ, who will stand for the Lord, who will say what the Lord has said in the pages of his scripture, will stand firm on that foundation. But there will be some who are upset. You know, Peter actually says there are some who are unstable and they twist the scripture to their own destruction. The psalmist said in Psalm 56, 5, all day long they twist my words, all their schemes are for my ruin. These people are depraved. Church, do not be a gullible sheep, please. That's why I'm so thankful that many of you are reading your scripture yourself. You're being a Berean. Don't expect to just get sound bites on Sunday and think that you're good to go. Please dive into it for yourself, for your sake, for your family's sake, for the sake of the church. We need to speak the word of truth, rightly handling the word of truth to make sure that we don't swerve from the truth ourselves because we could. Charge them before God. The church is supposed to be a pillar and buttress of truth and the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be our cornerstone. Let's pray.